Shall we rise up to pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We thank you for your people that you brought together. Thank you for all those who are gathering in various places and who are sharing the Bible study together. We pray that you are blessing your people here. You bless them too in Jesus' name. Open the scriptures to every heart. And those who have not known the grace of God and the salvation of the Lord, I pray, Lord, you lead them to see what provision you made on the cross of Calvary so that those who hear will repent and turn and be born again in Jesus' name. And for believers, children of God who already know you, I pray, Lord, as we look at the word of God and we see the wonderful things you provided through the days of Christ, I pray, Lord, will be richer and blesser, higher in the life of holiness and purity through your grace in Jesus' name. That as you have sacrificed everything for us, we'll be able to follow through and follow after Christ and sacrifice and give up everything for him so we can live a life pleasing to the Lord all the days of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's look at uh, the Word of God once again tonight as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We started the study of 1 Thessalonians uh, for some weeks now, and we looked at verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we've seen that these people, they received the gospel. And when they received the gospel, it made a great, great impact in their lives. And Paul, the apostle, writing to them and then reminding them of how himself, Silas, and Timothy, how they came to the Thessalonian people, and how they received the word of God, and how it made a great, great impact in their lives. He rejoiced on their behalf. And then remember them and remember the grace of God in their lives. And now he wants to talk about what the gospel did, how the gospel worked, and the power, the transformation that that gospel provided in their lives. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually walketh also in you that believe. You'll find that he spoke about the transforming power of the gospel in the lives of these uh, people, the children of God, how they believed on the Lord, and what great, great change, transformation, it turning around, making them a new creature in Christ, the great change it produced in them. We're looking at verses 5, 6, and 7 today of chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in what only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as she know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. We're looking at the study today titled, or the topic, The Transforming Power of the Gospel. You'll see in those verses we read together, and you'll see all throughout the epistle here, the first Thessalonians, that a great thing had been done. 
the gospel had come to them and it had a great transforming power upon them. We can see three things. Number one, transformed life. It transformed their lives. It turned them around. Then we can see number two, a transparent life. The life now everybody could see through. Nothing hidden. Nothing secret. Everything could be seen because of the great transforming power of the gospel. Transparent life. Transformed life. And triumphant life. And overcoming life they had. Life that overcome, overcame every sin. And overcame all the practices of society. Overcame all the pollutions that Satan wanted to bring in their lives. Let's look at the beginning of verse 5. As it says, For our gospel came not unto you in watch only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost. Read that all over again. It says, For our gospel came. How did it come? Not just by verbal pronouncement. Just, not just by proclamation. Not just by preaching. It came in power and it came in the Holy Ghost. And then it came in much assurance. That was assurance and conviction. It gave them conviction. It gave them assurance. It gave them to know that this is the way. What key therein. And they were so sure. They had so much conviction because of the great thing that had happened in their lives. In power, in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And then it says it came in affliction. That is, the persecution that came upon the lives of the people as a result of what they heard and as a result of yielding their lives to this Lord and to the gospel. There was much affliction and persecution, but they still continued. Look at verse 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. And then in verse 7, it says, And so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. I want to uh, point something to your attention in verse 5. Our gospel. For our gospel came not unto you in word only. Our gospel came unto you in power. Our gospel came unto you in the Holy Ghost. Our gospel came unto you in much with much assurance. It became our gospel. And Paul the apostle spoke about this gospel as a gospel because it was a gospel preached by him, by Silas, and by Timothy. In reality, it is the gospel of Christ, for there is no other gospel. Look at Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, he talks about this gospel and it says there's only one gospel, a unique gospel, a transforming gospel, a mighty gospel, a universal gospel, an everlasting gospel. A wonder-walking gospel. A life-changing gospel. Just one gospel. Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Look at verse, eight, verse 7, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul the Apostle here mentions the gospel of Christ. And he says there's no other. And there may be other people coming to you with another gospel. Adulterated gospel. Watered down gospel. A compromising gospel. A kind of gospel that is so weak and so anemic. That cannot touch any life, transform any life. Or make any life transparent and triumphant. It says there is no other. Then it says in verse 7, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you. I would pervert the gospel of Christ. Then he said in verse 8, but though we... Or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we are preached unto you. Let him be a curse, as we said before. So say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be a curse. For do I not persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. It was referring to the people that will modify the gospel, mutilate the gospel, destroy the gospel, adulterate the gospel, change the gospel, alter the gospel to suit the people they were talking to. And he said, if he did that, 
like those people that will change and alter just because they wanted to please the people. Then he said, it will not be the servant of Christ. Then he said in verse 11, but I certify you, I assure you, I'm giving you this assurance, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me, my gospel, our gospel, because we preached the gospel, I preached that gospel to you. It became personal. I took it out of my heart. The Lord made a deposit of that revelation. The mystery of the gospel unto me. And I possessed it. I had ownership of it. I will not let it go. Our gospel, my gospel. It said, it was preached of me. It's not after man. Neither, for I neither received it of man. Neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Writing then to those Thessalonian believers about this mighty gospel, powerful gospel, life-transforming gospel, Paul referred to it as our gospel. Yet, in reality, he was very careful. Even was he writing to those Thessalonians that this gospel is the gospel of God. Come back to First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 2 there. First Thessalonians chapter 2, looking at verse 2. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of, the gospel of who? Of God, with much contention. He made it very clear. Because if you see in chapter 1 verse 5, our gospel, you might think it was a private message, a personal message, a Pauline message, a, a message that Paul himself, that he imagined. And the source, maybe it was Paul. No, he said, the gospel of God. Look at verse 8. So, being affectionately desirous of you, were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God, God only, but also our own souls, because she was dear unto us. He made it very clear. It was the gospel of God. He made it clear as well. It was the gospel of Christ. First Thessalonians chapter three, verse two. First Thessalonians chapter three, verse two. And Saint Timotheus, a brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. In the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. What he called our gospel in chapter 1 verse 5. In chapter 2 it says it's the gospel of God. In chapter 3 it is the gospel of Christ. It is, he also made it very clear to the Corinthians. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He made it clear to them and to all the people that he was preaching to. Sometimes they'll say our gospel. Because he accepted it, our gospel because he believed it, our gospel because he preached it, our gospel because he emphasized it, our gospel because he presented it convincingly as if he had ownership of it. But, but then very quickly, he'll make them understand it is not a human gospel, not a personal gospel. It is not a cheap gospel. It's not something coming out from the origin of man. It is the very gospel of God. The gospel of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 3 and verse 4. In verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. You notice in that verse 3 it says, our gospel. Read on. Look at verse 4 now. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of who? Of Christ should uh, uh, our save uh, of our of christ and uh, ourselves uh, sorry in verse in verse four who is the image of god shall shine unto them it says it's a gospel in verse three and now in, in verse four it is the gospel of christ that makes you to understand then that when he said our gospel in first thessalonians chapter one verse five it wasn't making it cheap making it human Making having the source and the origin man or man anywhere, it is still the gospel of God, the glorious gospel of Christ. This good news of our salvation and total redemption planned by God and provided by Christ and proclaimed in the power of the Spirit of God, number one, is called the gospel of God. Romans chapter 15, verse 16. 
Romans chapter 15, verse 16. It says in verse 16 that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the, to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Number two, it is the gospel of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12. The gospel of God, number one. Number two, it is the gospel of Christ. Chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, verse 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, and not with the rather, nevertheless, we have not used this power, this right, this privilege, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of, of Christ. Number two is the gospel of Christ. Number three now is the gospel of the grace of God. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 24. Acts chapter 20 verse 24. But none of these things moved me. Neither count I my life down to myself. That I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I, re I have received of the Lord Jesus. To testify. To testify what? The gospel of the grace of God. It's the gospel emphasizing grace. Emphasizing the love of God. Emphasizing the mercy of God. Emphasizing the compassion of the Lord. In thinking about us and in planning for us. And in getting us out of our sin. Just by the marriage of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then by grace we get saved. That makes the good news, the message of salvation we hear. The gospel of Christ. Number four, it is the gospel of peace. Romans chapter, chapter 10, we're looking at verse 15. The gospel that we're here, the gospel of God, but then when you receive it, when you accept it, and when you believe it with all your heart, and when you stand upon it, and when you live by it, it becomes our gospel. But it's the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, and the gospel of the grace of God. And number four now, the gospel of peace. Romans chapter 10, we're looking at verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be saints? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of great, of good things. Number five, it is the gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of salvation. And when you hear the gospel, if you hear it right, when you believe the gospel, if you believe it right, and when you stand on that gospel, if you're standing squarely and purposefully on the word of God you are hearing, it's the gospel that brings salvation into your life. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Ephesians 1 verse 13. In whom also ye tr also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. The gospel of your salvation. Nobody can get saved except to hear the good news of salvation. The gospel of salvation. Yes, it's a gospel. In fact, even Paul the Apostle said, my gospel, very personal. I love it, I accept it, I preach it, I stand on it, I live by it, I present it to you, that you too, you'll have it and becomes yours and you get the benefit of it. Number six, it is the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is coming from the king of kings and then it brings you into the kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom. Chapter 24 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. And I'm reading there from verse 14. Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. The same gospel, gospel of God. The same gospel is the gospel of Christ. The same gospel is the gospel of the grace of God that presents the grace to get saved unto us. The same gospel is the gospel of peace that brings the peace of God into our souls, into our hearts, into our lives. It is the gospel of salvation and yet it is the gospel of the kingdom. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And how do you become born again? Because you hear the gospel. You hear the good news and you believe that gospel and 
and then you are brought into the kingdom and the gospel then becomes the gospel of the kingdom and the Lord Jesus Christ said and this gospel no the gospel this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come how do we come into the kingdom here in the gospel in Mark chapter 1 I'm reading from verse 14 and verse 15 Mark chapter 1 verse 14 now after that John was put in prison Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God you see what Jesus preached you see what the apostles preached you see what we are to preach you see what we are to believe the gospel of the kingdom of God verse 15 say and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel that's how we get saved repent ye and believe the gospel repent ye turn away from sin that's what the Thessalonians did and that's why they came to have the power of the gospel working in their lives and producing a transformed life producing a transparent life and producing a triumphant life. We're looking at Romans chapter 2 verse 16. The gospel. Now we started by pointing out that Paul the apostle said in talking about what they were preaching. Paul, Silvanus and Timotheus. He said it's a gospel that came to you. And when that gospel came to you, we preached that to you. And because we preached it, it was our gospel. And now he's going to say my gospel because it's referring to he himself alone now preaching to the Roman believers and he said my gospel Romans chapter 2 number 7 is my gospel Romans chapter 7 chapter 2 rather we're looking at verse 16 in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel according to my gospel he had real ownership of that gospel accepted the gospel believed the gospel and then lived by that gospel enjoyed the gospel and then he said it's like mine like my heart is mine my soul is mine yes my heart came from God my heart it was given by God but because it's mine and becomes useful keeps me alive it's my heart is my soul is my life and then he, he thinks of the gospel like that as well our gospel my gospel in first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 1 moreover brethren i declare unto you the gospel which i preached unto you think about that i preached it unto you my gospel and yet is the gospel of christ because christ gave it unto me and then it says which also ye have received and wherein ye stand by which also Ye are saved is the gospel of salvation. This gospel brings salvation, brings eternal life, brings you into the kingdom, makes you to be born again. It's by this gospel ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. I pray you'll not believe in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that, that which I received. I received it. So it didn't originate from me. It originated from the Lord. But I received it, accepted it. I, I owned it for myself, for my benefit. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. That when we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And when you present that gospel in the power of the Holy Ghost, it has a transforming effect on the lives of the people. And now you are able to present that gospel to other people. And I pray you'll be a preacher of the gospel yourself in Jesus' name. We're looking at the study tonight. The study is the transforming power of the gospel. And it's divided to three parts. Number one, persuasive preaching of the gospel. Preaching the gospel. That's what you do with the gospel. You accept it. You believe it, you receive it, allow it to work effectually in your heart. It turns you around, it gives you a transforming, a transformed life, a transparent life, a triumphant life. And then you declare it, you proclaim it, you present it to other people. And persuasively, you present and preach that gospel with power. Persuasive preaching of the gospel. Number two, persistent purity of the godly under persecution. 
when you receive that gospel, when you preach that gospel, when you are standing for that gospel and standing by that gospel, defending that gospel, and then you are presenting to other people, transforming power, making changes and transformation in their lives, is going to arrest the attention of the people around. And they're going to see that you are responsible for making people to turn away from their evil. They may persecute you. Then you remain pure, godly, righteous, holy, and sanctified under that persecution because the gospel is working mightily and powerfully in your life. Number three, positive pattern of godliness for other people. These Thessalonian believers became a positive pattern, a proper pattern, a powerful pattern, a life-changing pattern in the lives of other people because they lay by the power of the gospel. Number one, persuasive preaching of the gospel with power. Let's come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in words only. Stop there for a moment. He said, hey, what we gave to you was not just word, just verbal thing, just, declar just declaration. We're not just telling you the history of Jesus, the story of Jesus, how he went through Galilee and Capernaum and all those places. Many people are storytellers. They can tell stories. And they can say what Jesus did, how Jesus did it. But it has no penetrating power, no persuasive power. And it has no pungent power to be able to turn the lives of the people around. The good storytellers, interesting storytellers, entertaining storytellers. But those entertaining stories don't do anything at all in the lives of the people. And that's why Paul the Apostle said, when I came to you in Thessalonica, I didn't come just telling stories, entertaining you educating you, informing you, attracting you, and making you to know that I have a lot of information, giving information, it was to impact your life. It was not just to inform you. And it says, it came not in words only. And you know, there are many people that come to the Bible study, and they do not go beyond the words on the surface, the letter of the word and the preaching. They look at all the, you know, the, the presentation of the message, and what interests them is the persuasive preaching and the power full preaching and the pungent preaching and what we call alliteration in preaching. That is to start with PPP or SSS or TTT and that's all they look at and they just stay at the word. But Paul the apostle said, when I came to you, it wasn't just the presentation in words only. It was not just the verbal scene, the story that came to you. Then it says a gospel also came in power. And it came in the Holy Ghost. And it came in much assurance. See, Paul the Apostle has so experienced this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It transformed his own life. And he presented it in such a way. It transformed the lives of other people. It gave him a transparent life. A conscious void of offense toward God and toward men. And when he presented that gospel, it had the same effect and impact in the lives of the people he presented it to. It gave them a transparent life and day to day had consciences void of offense and before God and before men and give them a triumphant life the life of idolatry the life of obscenity and the life of defilement they lived before all that was gone and he said what the gospel did in us the gospel has done also in you it became part of his own life and became part of the lives of these Thessalonians as well his fellow laborers who had also received and believed the gospel took each to the heart and lived by it. Let's come back to this, the first Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you, in what only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. You know what he's saying? He said, whether it's me that preached, or Silas that preached, or Timotheus that preached, it came not in what only. You know, there are people that, and if you're not careful, you can fall into this trap. You have the power of the Spirit of God, but to join hands and you join uh, your ministry along with the people that don't have the word only, the word without the Spirit. 
the word was that the power of the Holy Ghost. And while you are preaching the word in power, they are preaching the word, they, they are preaching the gospel in word. While you are preaching it from your heart, they are preaching only from the head. While you are preaching it with every assurance and, com and com conviction that you have, they are, they are doing it superficially. And when those two people are, are together, one is spiritual, the other is secular. One is righteous, the other one is religious. One has the spirit and the other one is kind of having the flesh. And you join that together, you're not going to make a powerful presentation. But Paul, the apostle said, our gospel, myself and then Silas and Timotheus who have the same spirit, the same passion and the same pursuit and the same conviction and the same pungency. And when we presented it together unto you, our gospel came unto you not in word only but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. These people too had received that gospel and the gospel worked powerfully in them. And I pray that the same thing you are receiving will work mightily powerfully in you in Jesus' name. In Romans chapter 1, we're looking at verse 16. Romans chapter 1. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You know what Paul the Apostle is saying here? He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why are you not ashamed, Paul? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. The implication is this, I'll be much, much ashamed. If I went to Rome and I preached the gospel and their lives remained the same and there's no power to transform their lives, I'd be ashamed. If I went to Corinth, if I went to Thessalonica, if I went to Colossae, if I went to Philippi, if I jump from place to place, globe trotting, and I'm preaching the gospel and the gospel had no powerful effect and no pungent effect, no purifying effect in the life of anyone, I'd be much ashamed because then the gospel I'm preaching or be like just what the other people, psychologists and philosophers are telling. The same stories they are telling. But he said, you know why I'm confident? You know why I'm happy? You know why I'm triumphant and rejoicing? You know why I'm exuding with joy? It's because this gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. He said whether the Gentiles or Jews have, have had this experience that everywhere I go and I present the gospel not in what only but in power and in the Holy Ghost is having this transforming effect in the life of everyone and here we can rejoice together. I said we can rejoice together because that gospel has come to you in power as well. It has come to you transforming your life and you can testify that what you used to do, you are not doing anymore. Where you used to go, you are not going there anymore. This gospel that came to the Thessalonians has come to you as well. Not in what only, but in power, in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. You are so sure about what you have got that nobody can deceive you and nobody can sway you and nobody can distract your attention because now you are you're very sure that this thing that you have received, this is what will take you from earth to heaven in much assurance and that's why we preachers of the gospel that's why we're happy because it's doing something in your life and i pray it will do more and more in your life in jesus name in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 first corinthians chapter 1 we're looking at verse 18 it says for the preaching of the gospel to them that perish is foolishness the people that only like storytelling, the people that only like entertainment, the people that only like philosophy, the people that only waiting for psychology, the people that only waiting for stringing some words together in an interesting way. That's all they're looking for. The people that are waiting for their uh, emotion to be tickled, their mind to be tickled, their brain to be kind of exercised. It says the preaching of the gospel that comes with power. To them, it is foolishness because what they are waiting for, they have not seen. They are waiting for something tickling and something entertaining and something interesting. But then, Paul the Apostle says, I'm not for that. I'm not for entertainment. I'm for real change and transformation of life. That's why he says in verse 18, the preaching of the, of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. But to them which are saved, it is the power of God. I pray that that power once again will walk in your life. 
I, I've read it to you. We're going to read it again in First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. How it works in them. And how it's working in you. And it will work more and more. And then those who are just coming, how it ought to work in your life. When you're coming here, you'll hear the gospel that is uh, changing other people's lives, transforming other people's lives. That you, you will surrender your life. You turn away from your sin. You turn away from all the evil in your life, in your heart, in your, in your comportment and character. You turn to the Lord and then the power of the gospel will come in and do an effective transforming world in your life. Look at verse 13 of chapter 2. First Thessalonians For this cause also we thank God without ceasing. Because when you received that's, that's how to have the power working you receive. When you receive the word of God which ye heard of us ye received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth. The word of God which worketh in you effectually worketh in you, mightily worketh in you, powerfully worketh in you, effectively worketh in you, and spiritually, supernaturally worketh in you that believe. The word of God, when you hear, you're not just saying you're storing it in the head, but it's coming to your heart and your spirit and your soul, and every part of your life is being touched. And Paul the Apostle was rejoicing, and we will rejoice over you. I say we'll rejoice over you that this word of God will bring real transformation in your life. We're looking at, four, at uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 to verse 4. Hebrews chapter 2 reading from verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which you have heard. If you look at your life and you say, I'm hearing much, but there's not much change in my life. It says, give the more honest heed. I'm hearing the full gospel. But my life is only partially following. It says, give the more honest heed. I'm hearing the gospel, but the mighty change and the mighty transformation, it ought to work and produce in my life. I cannot see it yet. It says, give the more honest heed and sit back and sit down and look at the word of God and look at the power of the gospel and the way it transforms the lives of other people and let it work in you because it's not just hearing, receive it. Believe it, accept it, swallow it up, chew it up, digest it, and pray over it that, Lord, let it work in my life. Therefore, we ought to give the more honest seed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. That is, at the time of temptation, you forget the word. At the time of challenge, you forget the word. At the time when you are tried, you, you forget the word. It says, don't do that. It's the time when you really need it in your place of work. Everything you have heard, apply it there. In your home, don't forget you when you get to apply it there. In your school, don't forget you when you get there. It says you must not let it sleep at the time it ought to come forth from your heart and your life so that people will see the benefit of what you are hearing. For if the word in verse 2 spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received, it just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You will not neglect it. It says, those who come to the Bible study and hear the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of peace, the gospel of the kingdom, and the gospel that is changing lives all around. They hear of that gospel, but they are not saved. They are neglecting something. They are neglecting to repent. They are neglecting to allow the world to have the power in their lives. And they say, so shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. This salvation we're talking about in the gospel, it was preached for us by the Lord. And then it says, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now the gospel did something beyond just changing the lives of these uh, people. Let's come back to this, uh, uh, to this uh, epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. We're looking at chapter we're looking at chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in what only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as she know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. 
ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. The gospel came to them through the spoken word, but not the word only. It came in power, the power of the Holy Ghost, and produced a powerful effect in their lives. And you know what manner of men we were? And those people, they were saying, if God could change people like Paul, he was a persecutor, he has not become a preacher. If God could change somebody like Timothy, who was a fearful, timid fellow, and now the power of the Lord is working out in his life, and we can see that if God can change a person like Silas, who was a sinner just like us, because the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now it's a saintly, holy, righteous, and pure person. If the Lord can do that in them, the Lord can do it in us too, because he says, she know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And they say, God, do the same thing as you have done in their lives. And he did the same thing in their lives, he'll do the same thing in your life. I said they'll do the same thing in your life. And even though persecution came, they were able to stand in that persecution because the power was a, a kind of central scene in their lives. We're coming to point number two now. Persistent purity of the godly under persecution. Persistent purity of the godly under persecution. Let's come to chapter, chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians and we're looking at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, And ye became followers of us. And ye became followers of us. These uh, believers, they so much appreciated the lives of the preachers. They said, well, be like the preachers. Oh, they were not saying, well, he is an apostle. What do you expect? He should live like that. But me, I'm just a member of the church. No, they wanted to bridge the gap between the members and the ministers. They wanted to bridge the gap between the people and the preachers. And they said, oh, Lord, it's the same grace. If Paul, the apostle, is doing it because he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And that grace is available to everyone. And if Paul is what he was by the grace of God, I can be like that too. And Silas, I can be like that too. Timotheus, I can be like that too. That's why it says, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. They even said, we're not just uh, willing to follow after the apostles and the preachers and the pastors. We're even going to follow the Lord. And we're going to follow the Lord step by step and day after day. Then it says in that verse 6, I've been received the word in much affliction not just a little affliction, mild affliction. It, it's not just a, a little persecution, much persecution, but with joy, the joy of the Holy Ghost. When it says he became followers of us, what did that mean? And what is it that Paul the Apostle was talking about? He's talking about their lifestyle. And the lifestyle of those apostles and pastors and preachers is what these designers also, what they manifested. Look at chapter 2 verse 7. Chapter 2 verse 7. But we were gentle among you. Paul the Apostle, Silas and Timotheus, they were gentle. And those Thessalonians became gentle as well. You know, as idol worshippers were aggressive and violent and difficult and stubborn and kind of aggressive, but they saw the gentleness in the lives of Paul, Timothy, and Silas, and they became gentle to you, became followers of us, even as the nurse cherishes our children. They saw that these uh, preachers, they were acting like nursing mothers, very gentle, very compassionate, very merciful, very tender towards the believers. And they said, we too must be tender and gentle, like nursing mothers over their children. Then in verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we well, were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but our own souls because she was dear unto us. They saw that those preachers, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they had affection, real affection, unflagging affection. That is love. And they said, if Paul could be like that, Paul, that you know, didn't have any, any kind of mercy in his blood system, in his vein, before he just put people into prison and the gospel of God came in his life, turned him around. It could be this gentle and mild and meek and tender and loving and compassionate and merciful. We can be like that too. If God can take the most violent of all men and make him the most gentle of all men and the most tender of all men that he had this affection we can be like that too that's why they became followers of us followers of these preachers and then it says we're willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only we wanted to impart our very souls they became selfless sacrificial 
self-effacing. And he said, if these could be like that, sacrificial like that, we can be like that too. That's how they followed Paul and Silas and Timothy. And then it says, because you are dear and precious unto us. Because Paul counted the Tessalonians precious, he didn't know them before. They were not relatives. They were not from the same tribe. He came from Cilicia. He came from another place, Cyprus. But they, in Thessalonica, they were Gentiles. And he said you. And they saw that uh, this uh, Jewish preacher, Paul the Apostle, he forgot his tribe. He forgot his uh, culture. And he forgot his background. He loved us like this. Which you, we're going to forget tribalism. We're going to forget tradition. We're going to forget our own culture. We're going to count the people of God precious unto us. That's what it means when it says you became followers of us. It's not just that they were walking, following after them on the street. But following their character. Following the behavior and following their lifestyle and following their comportment. Look at verse, look at verse nine. For ye, for ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. And they saw that this uh, Paul the apostle, our labor and travail with Silas and then with Timothy. They were not lazy people. They were not indolent people. Hardworking people, laboring people, tra traveling people. That they'll work and work and work because it says for laboring night and day. Because we will not be chargeable to any of you. We we'll preach the gospel. We we'll, uh, we'll preach unto the gospel of God. It says you are not beggars. And they were watching their lives. They will preach in the night and walk during the day. And they said, look at this Paul. Look at this Silas. And look at this Timothy. That they were not beggars. They will walk with their hand. They were kind of laboring people, hardworking people. They become followers of us. They, too, they stopped all the begging and they stopped all the indolent life, all the lazy lives. That's what Paul the apostle meant when he said in chapter 1 verse 6, he became followers of all son of the Lord. Look at verse 10. He are witnesses and God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. They watched them. That these preachers, they had transformed life, they had transparent life, they had a triumphant life. They were holy, they were just, they were blamable, and they loved it. They said, we're going to do, they went on their knees, and they said, Lord, what you've done for Paul, what you've done for Silas, what you've done for Timothy, do it in us. And all of them together received that same transforming power, that same transforming life, and that same transformed life, tra transparent life, triumphant life. They received that. They became holy. They became just. All injustice and cruelty and violence and wickedness, everything was turned away from their lives, and they became unblameable. And Paul, the apostle, looking at their lives, he said in chapter 1, verse 6, you became followers of us who are watching you. You have been watching us. We are now watching you. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction, with, with joy, the joy of the Holy Ghost. Let's look at First Peter chapter 2. You became followers of us. Now you are going to become followers of the Lord as well. It says in First Peter chapter 2 verse 21, For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Now they became followers of the Lord. You remember it says, you received the gospel in much affliction. That he is in much persecution. That he is in much contention. That he is in much suffering. Pain and pressure brought upon them. Then they had heard about the Lord. Who is uh, our Savior. Who is our Lord. And they have seen that he gave us that salvation. He provided that salvation through much persecution. And much affliction. Even betrayal. Even slander. Even cruelty. Even violence. Even the death on the cross. Crucifixion. And then what they learned about the Lord, they became followers of the Lord. Because it says, for even here unto what ye called, because Jesus Christ, Jesus also suffered for us, leaving us an example. They followed after that example. That's why in their persecution, they will not complain. In their persecution, they will not murmur. They said, Jesus did it for us. They became followers of the Lord. Look at verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 
they became followers of the Lord. That Jesus did not commit sin, and yet he suffered. They too, they did not sin, because they are repented of their sins. Now they were living righteous, pure, and holy, sanctified lives. And yet, when persecution came, they didn't allow the persecution to make them sin. They didn't say, well, we have given our lives to the Lord, and now we are suffering like this. If we are suffering like that, why don't we go back to sin? Then they followed the Lord, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Look at verse 23, who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. They became followers of the Lord. That they have heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. When he was slandered, he didn't slander back. And so they also, the same way, when they were slandered, when, they were, when lies were told against them, they didn't defend themselves. And they didn't slander back. They didn't tell lies against the people that told lies against them. And then it says, when he suffered, he threatened not. They learned about the Lord. And they became followers of the Lord. That when Jesus Christ suffered, and when he suffered, he will not threaten them. He will not say, uh -huh, I'm going to call legions of angels from heaven to swallow you up and burn you up. And they too, when they suffered, they didn't threaten. And then it says, he committed himself to him that judges righteously. And they followed the Lord too. And they committed themselves unto him that judges righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to see should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. You find, you find that these people following after the Lord and following after the example of the preachers, the apostles that have been preaching the word unto them. When salvation comes to us, when we receive real salvation, that's what we do. That's what we do. We look up to the Lord. We look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we follow after the life of the Lord Jesus. And the grace that comes to us actually produces that life of Christ within us. Not only that, we look at the lives of the people who are preaching the gospel unto us. We don't belittle that life. We don't say, well, those are preachers. Say, well, that's the way they are supposed to live. Those are pastors. That's the way they are supposed to live and those are evangelists as the way they are supposed to live they follow after follow after the lives of those evangelists and pastors and preachers who are preaching to them when the gospel really comes to us in real power and i pray that although it has been manifested already it will manifested more in our lives in jesus name in philippians chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 14 philippians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 14 i was seeing what the lord is doing it says i pray toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, the Thessalonian believers, you know what they did? They looked at the purposeful life of Paul the Apostle and they also stopped living an aimless life just roaming about and doing things that will not matter for eternity. And now they said, look at Paul, look at the Apostle, look at Silas, look at Timothy and look at the way they're living their lives. Their lives are purposeful. And they are not engaged in anything that will not count for eternity. They have dropped all those things that will not have any recognition in eternity. And they are living this purposeful life. And they became followers of us preachers. And that's what we ought to do too. When you look at the lives of those who are preaching to you. And they are living purposeful lives, well-directed lives, spiritually guided lives. And you say, I want to be like that too. Like those that are unbelievers, I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in any sin ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us walk by the same rule. Walking by the same rule. That means as a preacher, so the people. As a minister, so the members. As the servants of the Lord, so the saints of God. As the leaders in the church, so the followers, so the members of the church. Walking by the same rule. Let us walk by the same rule. And let us mind the same thing, brethren. Be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. It says, that's the example you have, and that's the example you ought to follow. We're looking at Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians, we're looking at chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. It says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself 
angels from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the example, the tradition, the pattern ye have received of us. It says, look away from those other people, members of the church, members of the Thessalonian church. If there happens to be anybody like that, that is not following after our example, after our pattern, after the tradition we give to you, after the manner of life we demonstrated before you, if there are some independent people there, isolated people there, if there are some people there that are saying, well, I want to live my own life, don't mind what Paul is saying, let Paul live his own life, let me live my own life, let Timothy live his life, let Silas live his life, let me not follow after them. He said, watch those people, the people that will cut themselves away from the stream of holiness that we have shown you as an example it says withdraw yourself from such a man in verse 7 from such a woman too in verse 7 for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us you know without any shadow of doubt that we have led a good life a good example for you and you know how you ought to follow us he said for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you I pray that the Lord will give us uh, that kind of attitude to follow after those who are living righteously and holily and, sa and uh, saintly in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 12. In verse 12 it says that he be not slothful. Those Thessalonians, they saw Paul the Apostle, hardworking, agile, and very active, laboring. And the Thessalonian believers, they followed after. They were not slothful or idle. They were beggars in the fellowship. It says uh, over here now that she be not slothful, be not idle, be not lazy, be not indolent, but followers of them who throw faith and patience inherit the promises be followers followers of them the people that have preached the word of god unto you look at the sterling quality of their lives the purified life and the consistent life and the holy life and the righteous life and the sanctified life and the transformed life and follow after that and follow that patiently and persistently as well and let's look at uh, for us uh, hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, what to follow? We're not to say, well, that's the apostle, let him live his life, I will live my life. No, you have to follow after. And that's a pastor, let him live his life, let me live my own life. No, you have to follow after. Follow after the good example of holiness and righteousness and sanctification that we leaders are demonstrating before you. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, remember them which have the rule over you. And I've spoken, the, I've spoken unto you the word of God. Whose faith, was the next word? Whose faith follow? Follow the faith of the people of God and follow the lifestyle of the people of God and follow the consistency, the earnestness of the people of God, the holiness, the sanctification, and the transparency of the lives of the leaders that are leading us. It says, whose faith follow, constraining the end of their conversation. I pray that this same thing the Lord will do in your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Positive pattern of godliness for other people. Positive pattern of godliness for other people. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 7. So that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. You became examples. You understand what he's saying here? We're talking about a chain of reactions. It's like when you throw a pebble, a stone into the ocean. You have the ripples and it gets widening and widening and widening. It says, I started the life and then Silas and Timothy, they followed after me and they were just like me. And then the three of us, we came to Tesnaika. You saw our lives, so became converted and born again and our life is reproduced in you. All the people now, they see your life to you and you are becoming examples unto them. Do you see the chain we're talking to? First of all, we have the Lord Jesus Christ and in two, we have Paul the Apostle following after the Lord and then three now we have Silas and Timothy following after Paul the Apostle and then the Thessalonians they're following after Paul and Silas and Timothy and then the people in Macedonia and Achaia they're following after the Thessalonians and then other people will follow after them too don't let that chain stop at your doorstep 
let you continue. See the lives of the people who have preached unto you and see what we're standing on consistently all these years. We're not changing the doctrine all these years. We're not changing our stand all this year. We're not changing the standard of holiness all these years. We're not changing our courage and conviction all these years. Follow after us. Follow after a pattern and follow after the life of faith and the life of purity and the life of holiness that you see, that you observe. And then other people will see you too. They will follow after you. Other people will follow them who are following after you. And all of us, we are going to be holy. All of us, we are going to live the sanctified life. All of us, we are going to live the righteous life. All of us, we are going to live the submissive and the yielded life in Jesus' name. It says in that verse 7, so that ye were now examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. The faithful followers of the Lord and of the apostles became patterns of worthy example, uh, being followed by all the uh, worthy to be followed by all the people too. The Lord rewarded the faithful followers with faithful followership. That is, because we were faithful in following leaders, they too, the Lord made their lives to be lives worthy of being followed. Others had observed the firmness with which they embraced the gospel and the conviction and the courage on the persecution that they manifested. And all that believed in Macedonia and Achaia were impressed and inspired by the zeal which they showed in spreading the gospel even in their trials. And they became a model or a pattern of true righteousness, of true purity, and of the standard of purity and righteousness and sanctification to others for others to follow. Now, you need to understand something about Thessalonica as a city and Macedonia as a province and Achaia as a province. Macedonia was a province and Thessalonica was a city inside the province of Macedonia. Macedonia was to the north. Achaia was another province to the south of Thessalonica. And you have Philippi and, and you have uh, Philippi also in that province of Macedonia and Berea in that province of Macedonia. But now in the southern part you have Greece and Athens as well as uh, Corinth. And so you have uh, the people that were in Macedonia and in the north, they looked at, uh, the, at, at Thessalonica, they followed the example. And even those in the south, they also followed as well. And so these people demonstrating a worthy pattern of godliness, of purity, of sanctification, holiness, they have become examples for all that believe in faith. They became examples in charity and love. They became examples in hope. They became examples in a worthy work. They became examples in steadfastness and in holiness and sanctification as well as honesty and edification of the believers. And let's see the challenge we have before us now in First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 12. It says, let no man despise the youth. It says, what you should emphasize is not to use, emphasize your salvation. Emphasize your experience. The same gospel that came to the adult, that came to the youth. The same gospel that came to the men, that came to the women. Don't emphasize your womanhood. Emphasize the grace. Don't emphasize your membership. Emphasize the grace. Don't emphasize the local church you belong to. Emphasize the grace that has come to you. And don't emphasize your physical weakness. Emphasize the grace of God that has come and is teaching us to deny all ungodliness and worldly laws and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And when you emphasize that grace, it says, let no man despise your youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. I pray God will make you a worthy example. Then we're told in Titus, Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7 and verse 8, in all things showing thyself a pattern. Titus, you're a preacher, you'll not say, well, I'm a preacher and then I claim liberty for myself. I claim independence for myself. I, I can claim a you know, kind of a solidarity for myself because after all, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, I'm an evangelist, I'm a leader. And because of that, I don't have to walk by the same rule that everybody is walking by since I have this great position. He said, of all people, as a pastor, as a leader, as a minister, you are the one to show the example in all pattern, in all things showing thyself a pattern. In prayer, a pattern. In love, a pattern. 
in compassion, a pattern, in evangelism, personal evangelism, and open evangelism, show yourself a pattern, a pattern of good works, a pattern of hospitality, a pattern of friendliness, a pattern of good things being done, titles. That's what you must do. As the members are following examples, they, they need a worthy example to follow. And if you are a preacher, we need to see a worthy example in your life. So that in all things, in your family life, in your professional life, in your ministerial life, in the church life, everything that you do, it says in all things showing yourself, a pattern of good works in doctrine showing on corruptness, gravity and sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. I pray that that same pattern the Lord will produce in our lives in Jesus' name. We're looking at Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse seven, all through to verse nine. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse seven. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse seven. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, us, us preachers, us leaders, us ministers. If the ministers don't give clear sound clear direction, a clear pattern, a clear consens consistent work. If the leaders are something on Monday and nothing on Tuesday, we're confused. We don't know what we're going to do. Do we follow after what he did on Monday or what he did on Tuesday? If the leaders are not showing real purity and holiness and sanctification and transparency, if they're different in church as they are in their places of work, we're confused. We don't know what to follow. But it is when the leaders, when they are consistent at home, in the church, in the place of work, on Monday, on Tuesday, on Sunday, on the pulpit, and in the retreat, every time, everywhere, and that consistent life of holiness and sanctification is there. There's no confusion. And then we'll see the leader A or the leader B or the leader C or the leader D and we go from place to place, state to state, and region to region, and country to country. The same example we we'll see in this country in leadership. we we'll see in another country there's no confusion. we we'll say praise the Lord all our leaders in every state, in every region, every locality and every, every country. They have the same lifestyle, the same family lifestyle, and the same doctrine, and the same standing, the same standard, then there's no confusion. But when the standards vary from place to place, from leader to leader, from country to country, from state to state, from region to region, from local church to local church, the members are confused. Let us not be confused. We ought to maintain the same standard. We're going to keep the same standard in Jesus' name. For ye yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, for, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, not because we have not the right, not because we don't have the authority, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Everything the leaders did, they were mindful of the membership. They say, if I do that, what will the members think? How will it affect the members? The same thing we should be thinking about as well. That we're thinking about how it affects the members of the church, what we do, how we speak, how we relate, how we interact, and the places we go, and the things we do, and the things we don't do. How will, that, how will it affect the members of the church? Or we think about that. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, man of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at, at Antioch and at Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. The Lord will deliver you. And it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, de deceiving and being deceived. You know what Paul the Apostle is saying over here? He's telling us, he's saying that, you know, there are some people that say the persecution is there. I'll not become a Christian now. I'll not give my life to the Lord now. I'll just do whatever is, you know, being done now. But I know heaven is real. I know hell is real. I know that if you are not born again, 
sin and you die in sin, you are going to go to hell. And I'm not going to go to hell, but I'm going to slow down. I'm going to delay my conversion. When the persecutions die down, when the persecutors slow down, and when the, there's no persecution anymore, and then Christianity becomes very popular, and nobody is persecuting anybody anymore, then I'll give my life to the Lord so that I will not suffer. And the Paul the Apostle is saying that's deception. Look at it in verse, in verse 13. It says in verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? Persecution, all, all, all that will live godly. How about the people that are trying to use worldly wisdom and they say, I'll slow down. I'll not give my life to the Lord now. I'll not be born again now so that I can. Because I, I see that a little uh, sister in our school and I see the way they are persecuting her. I can't bear that now. I'll get saved later when there's no persecution anymore. And in that lady in the community is saying, I see how they are persecuting that lady that is born again. And the husband is, uh, you know, putting some fire against her life. I'm not going to get born again now. But I'll get born again later when there's no persecution anymore. Look at verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax better and better. <coughs> what? But worse and worse. That is, the persecutors are going to be more cruel. If there is any time to be born again, this is time to be born again because they, before they become worse and worse. Get born again today. Because if you delay, you might never be born again because the persecution is in, in getting intense getting greater, getting worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou. As the persecutors are persecuting and they're becoming worse and worse, don't allow that to intimidate you or to frighten you. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I want you to come back to verse 10. It says in verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my long suffering, my charity, my patience. You notice one thing there, number one, the word doctrine comes first. And then after that you have the manner of life. Your manner of life is going to be produced by the doctrine you believe. If you believe a kind of a watered down gospel, a watered down doctrine, a mutilated doctrine, a kind of doctrine that is weak and anemic, that is not strong, not sound doctrine. Your life is going to take after your doctrine because every other thing follows after the doctrine you believe. If you believe wrong, you are going to live wrong. If you believe something cheap, your life is going to be cheap. If your doctrine is uh, watered down, your life, man of life is going to be watered down. It says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. After that, you see what follows my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, my charity, my patience. All that is followed after the doctrine. Now, what he calls my doctrine there, I want you to look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're looking at verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. My doctrine, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continuing them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Is the doctrine that saves. Thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Have you had, have you had some people that say, well, we don't have any doctrine. You don't have any manner of life. You don't have any purpose in life. You don't have any steadiness, steadfastness in life. You don't have any conviction. You don't have any courage. You don't have anything to stand for. You don't have any doctrine. You don't have anything to stand for. But it's the people that have something to stand for. They are the people that have the good manner of life. A sound doctrine, a sound manner of life. Look at John chapter 7 verse, 7, verse 16. John chapter 7 verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but he is that sent me. That's the same thing Paul the Apostle was saying, my doctrine, but it wasn't really his doctrine. It's, it belonged to the one that sent him. Christ said, my doctrine is not mine, but him that sent me. Then he says, if any man will do his will, he will know of the doctrine. You cannot do his will if, you're not, if you don't know the doctrine. It is the doctrine that produces your manner of life, your practice. 
If you're going to know what to do, and you're going to do it right, it is a doctrine. So you cannot say, well, I don't care about doctrine. You must care about doctrine. If you care about eternal life, if you care about sanctified life, if you care about transparent life, you must care about doctrine. Because it says, he that will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine whether I, I, uh, it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 28. Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verse 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his doctrine. That's the Sermon on the Mount. That's doctrine. Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. You live by that. That's the doctrine. And that's what Paul the Apostle is saying. He's saying that if we're going to live a life that is commendable, a life that is trustworthy, a life that is confident that you're going to get to heaven and it's going to produce a good manner of life, it must be based on the doctrine of Christ, astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as a scribe. Second John, Second John 1 chapter, Second John 1 chapter from verse 8. In Second John, reading from that Second John verse 8, it says, look to yourselves, and that we lose not the, those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine. Doctrine of who? Have you noticed what Paul, the apostle, has, has done? He said, my gospel, our gospel, and yet it's the gospel of Christ. My gospel, gospel of God. My gospel, gospel of grace. My gospel, gospel of peace. My gospel, and it's the gospel of salvation. My gospel, and it's the gospel of the kingdom. He's saying the same thing with the doctrine. It says, my doctrine. You have known my doctrine. You have known my manner of life, my persecutions, my afflictions. And you have known my patience and long suffering, my doctrine. And really, in reality, it's the doctrine of Christ. That's why it says in verse 9, whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. You know, the people that say, well, I don't have any doctrine. I just, you know, flow along. I just, uh, you know, go along with anybody that wants to name the name of Christ. I don't have any doctrine. They don't have God. They don't have Christ. They don't have grace. They don't have a purified life. They don't have a sanctified life. They don't have a holy life. Because it's a doctrine that produces the manner of life. And it says, whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not, what? This doctrine, anybody comes to you and then he has no doctrine, he has no teaching, no good manner of life, no scripture. Only story, only entertainment. Anyone that comes to you and he has not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is what? Tell me out loud. Partake of his evil deeds. I'll not be a partaker of evil deeds. I said I'll not be a partaker of evil deeds. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. I'm reading to you from verse 7, verse 12. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. And we're looking at verse 7. Acts chapter 13, verse 7. It says he was the deputy of the country, such as Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul, desiring to hear the word of God. He wanted to hear the word of God. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, then the deputy, that same man, when he saw what was done, he believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And the doctrine of the Lord, it was Paul the Apostle there preaching. My doctrine, my doctrine, doctrine of the Lord is the doctrine of the Lord. First Timothy chapter 1, in First Timothy chapter 6 rather, First Timothy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke couch their own masters worthy of all honor, not disrespectful, but that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. 
live right so that the doctrine the doctrine of God will not be blasphemed and the name of God will not be blasphemed it says in verse 3 if any man teach otherwise not teaching the doctrine of God if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness the doctrine which is according to godliness that's what produces the right manner of life and that's what the macedonians that's what they got that's what the Achaia, the people in Achaia, that's what they got as well and that's what we are getting and i pray to be a fruit in your life in jesus name and it says if any teacher otherwise and they don't bring this doctrine that's according to godliness then in verse 4 is proud and is knowing he knows nothing doting about questions and stripes of wars, whereof comet envy and strife and railings and evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Tell me the rest. Tell me out loud. Say to a confidence. From such, withdraw that self. The people that come to you, I don't have any doctrine. I don't believe any doctrine. I'm just, you know, floating in the air. And I just say, uh, you know, say whatever comes in my mouth. And I don't, you know, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, going from Genesis to Revelation, reading so many parts of the Bible. I don't believe in that. All I believe is just, you know, whatever comes, I just tell the story that comes. says, withdraw from them. You don't have anything to do with such people. We're looking at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 and I'm reading to you from verse 17. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And do what? Befriend them. Do what? Avoid them. You're not going to be playing some games and, you know, playing pranks. So the people that cause division and offense contrary to the doctrine which you learn because it's that doctrine that will produce a sanctified manner of life and it's that that will prepare you and get you ready for heaven it says brethren i beseech you mark them mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fierce speeches, flattery deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad to all men. I pray this will be true of you. That your obedience, your lifestyle, your good life will, become, will come abroad to all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. What he's saying here is what he said about the Thessalonians. And it's what I want to say about you. And I'll say it about you in Jesus' name. I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would that she be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. That is, be ignorant of evil and just concentrate on that which is good. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet when shortly. The people that stand on the doctrine, the people that believe the doctrine, the people whose manner of life is dictated by the doctrine, the people who are good examples to others in Macedonia and Achaia, the Lord God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That what we have learned today, the Lord will take this and he'll produce it in your life, produce it in my life, produce it in our lives together. And the positive impact that the word of God ought to make, that he made in Senior believers, he'll make into your life as well. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. You see these believers in Thessalonica, they believe the Lord, they believe the gospel. And that gospel changed their lives. And that's the reason why you came to study. And you must take it to the Lord in prayer. That's what the Tesman believers did. That's why it produced something in their lives. And they had a transformed life. Where is your transformed life? They had a transparent life. Where is your transparent life? They had a triumphant life. Where is your triumphant life? Tell the Lord, O oh Lord, here am I today. Those Thessalonian believers, what believers they were. I want to be such a believer too. I want to be such a believer too. Tell the Lord that the word of God will not just come to you to entertain you. It will tell you stories. 
to come with power, come with authority, come with conviction, pungent power, penetrating power, purifying power in your life. Pray that the gospel will have its transforming effect in your life. That you have transformed life in the church, transformed life at home, transformed life in the office, transformed life among your friends, transformed lives even under persecution, transformed lives when the road is rough, transformed lives when your responsibilities increase, transformed, transparent, triumphant. Pray that this gospel will become your own gospel. Gospel of God, gospel of Christ, becoming yours. Affecting your soul, your spirit, your heart and your life, your lifestyle, your talking, your posture, your behavior, your character, your manner of life, until the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ becomes your own very gospel, our gospel, my gospel. Pray it will be for you the gospel of grace. That the grace of God will be visible in your life as you receive this gospel. Gospel of peace. Making you peaceful, making you a peacemaker. Not a troublemaker, not a wicked man, not a violent man. That the gospel, the gospel of peace, will become your own gospel, producing the peace of the gospel in your own life. Gospel of salvation, making the salvation of Christ, salvation of God, salvation that this gospel brings to be visible, manifest in your very life. The gospel of the kingdom. Coming from the King of Kings are the source. Making you to live the kingdom life. Reigning in life. Reign over temptation. Reign over your trials. Reign over the flesh. Reign over the world. And bring all those abominations of the world under your feet. Make this gospel of, your, of the kingdom your very gospel. The word has come to you. The preaching has come to you. Not in word only. It's come in power. The power of the Holy Ghost. You felt it. You knew it. You accepted it. You believed it. Let it be a pungent, powerful, productive gospel. Producing the proof in your life that you have surrendered your life, submitted your life, yielded your life to the Lord, the God of all grace. Let's see the power. Let's see the proof. Of this transforming gospel in your life. Let's see the product, the fruit of a transformed life, of a transparent life, a triumphant life in you. That's how the Thessalonians got it. Just by prayer. They received the gospel. They believed the gospel. They prayed it through. They prayed it in. And they brought it forth. 
That they, they, when they went to their places of work the following day, they manifested gentleness and peace and faithfulness and hard work and affection and love. That's what it produced. And the Lord is saying, let it produce the same effect in your life as to go back home. As to go back to your place of work tomorrow and this week. Let the people see something worthy of emulation. Something they can follow. Let me see the gentleness that the gospel produces. The affection of a mother, of a nursing mother, the tenderness that the gospel produces, the travail and the labor, following after the lifestyle of the apostles, and get rid of that laziness, idleness, begging your life. It produced holiness and justice, righteousness. The lives of Paul, Silas, Timothy. And that's exactly what it produced in the Thessalonian believers. God is witness and ye are witnesses also. A holily, justly, and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believed. They saw that in Paul, they saw that in Silas, they saw that in Timothy. It came into their lives. And the people of Macedonia and Achaia saw it in the lives of the Thessalonians too. Let's see it in your life too. Let's see it in your life too. That we can say that you can say, God is witness and your neighbors are witnesses. God is witness and your classmates and your schoolmates are witnesses too. God is witness and your neighbors and co-workers are witnesses too. Are holily and justly and unblameably you behave yourself among the people that watch your life. They became followers of the Lord and became followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. In suffering, in persecution, in affliction, they didn't murmur, they didn't complain, they didn't grumble, they didn't threaten, threaten. They're not threatening other people persecute me, you do this to me, I'm going to do that to you. They followed after the Lord who suffered without complaining. Be ye followers of the Lord too, so which you can follow you. The apostles lived purposeful lives. Lives that will be rewarded in eternity. That's what the Thessalonians followed. You live a purposeful life too. Spirit controlled life. Spirit directed life. Worthy of emulation. Worthy of being followed. And Paul the Apostle said, you know my doctrine and my manner of life. Paul was not a person that rejoiced in being void of doctrine, empty of doctrine. He said, I have the doctrine, the doctrine of Christ. Make it mine. I possess it. I believe it. I own it. My doctrine. Make it yours. Make it yours. 